today. Um, thank you for taking the time to come on this program. We appreciate your attention. Um, I want to say Happy New Year. Gang Hei Fa Choi and Happy uh, Black History Month as well. Our communities are super busy, lots going on, lots to celebrate. This is, in my opinion, it's always been a very inspiring city. So we appreciate your attendance today. And again, thank you. It looks like we have a full house, so um, we appreciate it. You'll get a copy of the recording, the full recording and highlights after this program is over is, is over as well. So for the most part, San Francisco, the nation, the world have emerged from uh, the pandemic. People are eager to reconnect and rediscover their city. And now's the time to celebrate the people and places that make the city hum. The city by the bay, as we all know, is a beacon of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're proud to be working with our community partners at Lime to highlight these uh, community leaders and neighborhood ambassadors uh, to this program. Today's uh, forum is focused on uh, these iconic San Francisco neighborhoods, uh, the Bayview, Dogpatch, Chinatown, and North Beach. We'll hear from our community leaders and neighborhood ambassadors about what's going on now. And in many ways, there's a renaissance in our neighborhoods and uh, you'll find out shortly from these people. And remember to stay for the complete program because we'll be announcing gift certificates to uh, small businesses in these communities. And we'll have a grand prize winner, unlimited line rides throughout the city to one person. So stay till the end for that. In today's program, our panelists will paint a high level picture of these special neighborhoods and the role their organization is playing in preserving and promoting uh, their district. So let's get started. My name is Vas Kineris. I am a small business advocate here in San Francisco. As an immigrant from Greece, I'm all too familiar with the challenges, successes of running a small business. In fact, all my family uh, members in Greece and here are in small business. So every day around the dinner table, that's what we talked about, small business, challenges, successes. I also had a design store in the Fillmore for 20 plus years. And I closed it recently to focus on the small business advocacy work that I do now for the city. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we started uh, NextSF, this organization. It's an agency think tank that creates private public partnerships to promote small business, neighborhood corridors, and culture in the city. So today I'd like to welcome you to our It's Time to Lime neighborhood program, which has been sponsored by our friends at Lime. Thank you. And before we begin our program, uh, we have a few housekeeping rules. Today's webinar is being recorded. So if you miss something or wanna share it, uh, wait for the follow-up thank you email from us or go to our website or our YouTube channel. And we encourage everyone to tweet and repost this program to highlight the neighborhoods and the businesses that we're featuring today. Uh, so sit back, enjoy the program. And of course, if you have any uh, questions, please drop it in the Q&A section up above and we will ask the question to the participating uh, panelists during our Q&A section. So again, please uh, sit back, enjoy your favorite beverage, and let's get the program started. Um, I'm proud to present my friend, Charlie Mastolon Mastoloni, Senior Government Relations at Lime. Welcome to the stage, my friend. Thank you, Vasim. Super excited to, uh, to be here and have the privilege to uh, you know, have these conversations with so many uh, folks within the community here. Um, you know, it's definitely an exciting month here. Happy Black History Month. Um, Happy New Year to everyone. And um, yeah, um, so to kind of give uh, everybody a little bit of background about myself is originally I'm from Connecticut. I moved here five years ago and um, currently I live within Haight-Ashbury within the city. So on um, right off of um, kind of the Waller Street, Coal Valley slash Haight-Ashbury area. And um, I have been at Lime now for six months. And the reason why I'm so excited to, to be here and have the privilege, privilege to be having these conversations with so many business leaders within the community is for me, small business has always kind of uh, defined and been a part of my family. Um, I'm the son of, um, or I'm fourth generation um, Italian immigrant. Um, my great grandfather started a uh, pearl business in New York City um, in the early 40s, and that's actually been my family 
um, for in all of our generations since my dad has uh, has been running it. Um, and kind of from there, that really has watered down into my passion for small business and why I really like having, uh, you know, the opportunity to have these conversations and to overall find ways to bridge the gap between tech companies and specifically Lime and small businesses. Because for me, I think that that is the most important part of operating within, within San Francisco is being able to take the time to listen to um, folks within the communities to know what we can be doing to empower small businesses to know that, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're all here together and we want to be able to create an environment that everyone succeeds and thrives in. And so um, I'm really privileged to be a part of a conversation specifically with some business leaders, um, you know, within within District 10, within District District 3, which I know are two very, um, with two, two districts with such a rich history of small businesses. And um, yeah, I'm happy that Lyme can hope to play a small role in helping to continue to bring residents from without the city to and from these small businesses and be able to continue to provide a sustainable alternative transportation method for uh, residents and to continue to be able to create a business environment where everybody succeeds. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And that's one lesson that I learned personally with this agency during the pandemic. 2020 onwards, it's all about private public partnerships. Um, you know, we don't always agree, but you know, as long as the discussion is there, we can, you know, we can uh, find solutions to work better together. So thank you, Charlie. We appreciate your, um, your, your message and uh, we really appreciate your engagement with the community as well. So uh, before we begin with our panelists, we'd like to present a short video montage showcasing our curated neighborhoods. Take it away, Dominic. sweet you know really uh showcases san francisco is such a small city but um it really showcases the amount of diversity that exists in the city and me personally i love to ride on lime around the city it's such a fun way to discover the city and you don't have to look for parking you can buzz around you can go right in front of the store um and you know and park your lime safely of course in a bike rack but um thank you uh so uh, but before we begin with our panelists, we do have a uh, poll that we'd like to offer to our audience. Um, so take it away. Uh, it's time to Lime. When what year was Lime founded? 2006, 2011, 2014, or 2017? So we'll wait about 15 seconds. Yeah, so 2017 is the correct answer. And wow, woo, you guys know, 43% of you said 2017. So that's exciting. Thank you, you know your stuff. That's impressive, right, Charlie? That is impressive. I, yeah, good job, everyone. All right, so first up, we've got uh, my friend Ida Pantaleo Zubi. She is a third generation of the iconic Cafe Trieste neighborhood institution, city institution in North Beach and the president of the North Beach Business Association. So Ida, welcome to the stage. Always a pleasure to pop into your cafe. It's such a 
hub for the uh, <laughs> North Beach. Um, tell us, first of all, a little bit about yourself and uh, your family's legacy, the cafe, and what's happening in North Beach. Well, thanks for having me, boss. And nice to see everybody. And I'm, as you said, I'm the third generation of the Cafe Trieste. My grandfather founded the cafe in 1956. And I grew up in the cafe every weekend when I wasn't at school. I was hanging out there. My uncle John Franco, my mom, my aunt Yolanda, my aunt Adrian, just the whole family. And it's everyone we hung out with, you know, when I was, especially when I was a child, a lot of them still come there. A lot of them were customers that we've been so close. We're like family. And it's been really exciting, you know, just so much going on. I'm glad we got through the last few years and, you know, when it happened about the help of the community and there's all the neighbors in the area and all the businesses as well. You know, everyone, you know, really stuck through it. And we were fortunate enough for most part to get through it and moving on and North Beach is booming right now. It's doing really, really well. I'm excited for everything that's coming up in the future now in the neighborhood and the cafe. We're in our 67th year. And uh, I'm also the president of the North Beach Business Association. And we're working on a lot of projects. We're the only business association in North Beach to represent the small businesses with the city, with the events. We, produced a North Beach Festival that's coming up in June. We have First Fridays, which is every first Friday of the month we exhibit. We have all the art galleries are open. We have live music. I hope you guys can make it down. It's just really, you know, with the help with everyone, you know, as I said, everyone in the neighborhood, everything's just, you know, luckily we're able to produce these and have these great events. Amazing. Um, Ida, I wanted to just go back to the cafe because I'm, I'm always amazed each time I learn something new about this cafe. So it started in 1956. What was North Beach like back in 1956? The beatniks were there, right? Pre hippies. From, right. From what, what I some hear. Of the notable, yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of when a cafe opened, it was you know the first Italian style espresso house on the West Coast, and my grandfather he wanted to bring that style, that tradition, to San Francisco. So we found this location, we found this location and opened the cafe and it started attracting not just locals or business people, and but he was so welcoming to everyone that writers started coming and, you know, poets and, you know, different artists. It just started, you know, the word got out and all of a sudden, you know, 40 years later, we find out like the Francis Ford Coppola worked on a screenplay, The Godfather at the cafe. And lots, you know, many of the poets from the beat generation hung out and sat at that middle table. We have great iconic photos from this era. I never knew that, you know, 60 years down the line, if you're looking back and just amazed at how much history, how many things happened at, on that corner of North Beach. <laughs> yeah, and um, North Beach was, you know, there were all these amazing jazz venues and the bookstores and it was it was an amazing i mean it's still nice but i mean back then it's it's hard to imagine you know all the oh, things definitely. that were happening yeah. and music live music was a big part of it as well my, my whole family you know sang and they'd have you know get together it wasn't formal you know they'd get together mandolin player would come the pianist and they were singing opera and different italian folk songs and just people really this was something new something new and you know and every other business had something new that they brought to the neighborhood that just totally developed this culture in North Beach. Absolutely. So um, um, it's 2023. Let's do fast forward to uh, <laughs> North Beach now. Um, no place is perfect, but you know, North Beach for me is always vibrant. There's always daytime, nighttime. Paint for us a picture of the, the neighborhood now. There's um, You're doing a lot of events, I notice, and the the shared spaces, the public spaces are vibrant. Yes, I mean, the shared spaces started in North Beach, actually on our corner during, after about two months after the shutdown, we met with Aaron Peskin, now as the president of the Board of Supervisors. And we had asked him like, hey, what can we do? Because a lot of these businesses were not reopening. They could not, could not or would not, or weren't comfortable having people come indoors. How can we utilize the space outside? And, you know, flash forward, like at least two weeks after that, we had barricades outside in front of the cafe, set up like a little 
makeshift, you know, share spaces parklet. We had a press conference and then it just spread. <laughs> we rented barricades, the port donated barricades, and we set it up and all the businesses that need them, we provided them just to get through that, you know, really hard time. And it's really Fantastic. caught on. <laughs> and now it's, I mean, it's, it was basically definitely a lifesaver for so many people. Awesome. And um, if we move into the future, like you, you're planning to do more events, is the film, uh, the, the North Beach Jazz Festival coming back? Well, the North Beach Festival, actually last year we came back, last year was our 66th year. It's our 67th now. We were really excited. Mm -hmm. We had a great turnout last year. Um, it's on Father's Day weekend in June, and we close the street from Grand Ave, all the way down Grand Avenue, from Columbus down to Filbert and parts of Columbus Avenue, Vallejo Street and Green Street, and it's really fun. You have live music, you have many vendors and arts and crafts and food. And it's just a great opportunity for people to get together and really enjoy the neighborhood. Excellent. And if someone wants to know what's happening in North Beach, what uh, like what social media handles would you suggest or where, where can people look for these events? So North Beach Business Association has Facebook page and First Friday's Facebook page and on Instagram as well. So just go on there and we list out, you know, who's playing or you know what's you know going on. North Beach Festival, that website will be updated soon for this year's events. You know, I do have to say one thing. Prior to the shutdown, there were so many vacancies in North Beach, especially on Grand Avenue. In the past 18 months, they've pretty much all filled up, which is so amazing. The Savoy Tivoli's back, and they were gone for a while. We have a new jazz club on Broadway called Keys that is really amazing. I mean, there's so much to do now, and, and I'm really excited that people are thriving and they're able to you know, open up, you know, take that risk and people are coming. So I'm really, really excited about that. Thank you for mentioning that because my feeling is North, North Beach has such a diversity of venues, nighttime, daytime, you know, for all people, you know, visitors, residents. And um, it's, it's a very special, you know, it's a very inspiring neighborhood because they made this uh, turnaround during these really difficult times. So Thank you, and um, we'll talk about what to do at North Beach later on in the Q&A, okay? One more thing. If yeah. next time you come to North Beach in the evening, look up, you'll see from the beginning of Grant to Columbus all the way down to Filbert and parts of Green, we just finished our lighting project. This North Beach lighting project. There's green, white, and red lights, and you can see it all the way from across from the other end of Grand Avenue. It's so beautiful. And I love it. the merchants are so happy if people walk out, they're like, oh, this is nice. It's going to be here all year. So that's another exciting project. I love it. Thank you for all that you do, Ida, you and your team. You guys are killing it over there. And thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Take care. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So uh, before we begin with our next neighborhood, uh, drum roll, we're going to announce the winner for... Um, for the gift certificate to a North Beach uh, business, uh, TBD on the business. But uh, our winner is our friend, James Bolton. Congratulations, James, you won. I know you've attended many of these programs in the past and uh, we really appreciate you sticking with us. Yeah. So uh, I'll reach out to you, uh, James, and we'll connect you with the owner. Okay, next up, we're, we're gonna stay in district three. We're going to uh, Chinatown. You know, it is the U.S.'s oldest and largest Chinatown community. It's really an economic, cultural treasure that we have here in the city. And um, I'm always amazed when I go there. It's so vibrant. And it's like you've stepped off an airplane into a new country. So um, I want to welcome our friend uh, Ava Lee. She is the president of the Chinatown Merchants Association a mega, mega, mega community leader in the city and as well as in Chinatown. So welcome to the stage, Eva. Hi, everyone. Hi, Voss. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Eva Lee, uh, representing the Chinatown Merchants Association. Just to give you a little bit of my background. Uh, I've been around Chinatown a long time, actually. I grew, uh, I was, um, I, uh, grew up in Chinatown with my parents set up a shop in, in the 1950s. And uh, I basically grew up there starting in the shop at around eight years old. And uh, 
back then in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, I know Chinatown was thriving. It was a very popular San Francisco destination. But unfortunately, 1989 came along and then we had the Loma Prieta earthquake. And unfortunately, the roadway, uh, that freeway was like an artery into Chinatown. It came into Washington Street and to Broadway. So there's two exits that came right into Chinatown. So unfortunately, the, the freeway, uh, even though the Chinatown Bridge was established, to try to save that roadway, uh, we were defeated and that um, the, the mayor decided to have it torn down. And uh, so we had to figure out what to do from there. And with a suggestion actually from Jim Lazarus, the, the San Francisco uh, Chamber of Commerce, he said, why don't you have like some of, uh, you know, like a street fair or a closure. So then we decided to uh, take them up on that offer. And we had back in 1991, um, the first time Grand Avenue was closed off to street traffic. Um, and uh, so from there, we continued with my parents got a lot more uh, business people involved. And then we started the Autumn Moon Festival, which started in 1991, so 33 years ago. Um, so that's based on a thousand year tradition. And we, we have it like, it's several blocks along Chinatown on Grand Avenue. Here's the lanterns that people will see as they come. And he's gonna just show you a little montage of, of Chinatown and all the events that happened there. And see, so you can see some of the crowds where we um, uh, closed off some of the streets. And um, actually, what he's showing right now is the China Cultural Sunday, Sunday that we're planning to re, uh, restart uh, starting in the spring and summer so it can become again a, a pedestrian wall where people can walk and enjoy the area, the, the lanterns, what it's known for. Um, so we're going to invest uh, in the works. And then I have a couple more slides to show come of just, just some of the festivities and that you'd see in, in, in our events. And this is a picture of the uh, line dance in, in the Autumn Moon Festival. As you can see, we have crowds of people that come. And of course, the famous dragon ends up on the finale on the weekend. Um, that's on Sunday of that Autumn Moon Festival weekend. And that, that's White Crane. And they're, they're, they're fantastic. Um, so, the lanterns are one thing that we wanted. Actually, what happened on Walkway Weekends is during the pandemic, the um, it was devastating. I, I know a lot of people will not realize, just like North Beach, it was just like a ghost town. And so when it when finally the retail started to reopen, um, we took advantage also of the shared spaces program and um, allow for three blocks of Grand Avenue to be closed so that become a pedestrian mall and that they could observe and experience the really the, the architectural designs and, and more soak in more of what Chinatown historically is all about, including these red lanterns. Um, so that's um, the program we still continue. We stopped it for a little while, but we'll recontinue it. And again, uh, another photo of the Autumn Moon Festival, which now we are in our 33rd year. Um, and we're still going strong. And a matter of fact, a lot of uh, communities outside of San Francisco has, have started their own Autumn Moon Festival that I've noticed in South Bay, even our own Clement Street over in the Sunset, uh, they started it, but actually we were doing the original um, Autumn Moon Festival. Um, so uh, if you wanna find out more information about Chinatown events, you can look at that website and also on our Instagram uh, at, um, S at SF CMA and Voss is helping us do some wonderful reels to highlight some of the small businesses. And we've had a good time. We've got a lot of views and just uh, encouraging people to come to Chinatown and enjoy a lot of these special uh, treats and, and sites in, in Chinatown. Awesome, thank you, Eva. You know, and um, it's such an honor <clears throat> to highlight these merchants because our merchants as well as you everyone has a story and <clears throat> it's such an honor to um, highlight these uh, professional personal journeys that these merchants have gone through and the stories are very impactful um, some are immigrant you know 50 percent of all small businesses are owned by immigrants that's a fact and their stories are amazing and um 
Unfortunately, the social media rules have changed, as, especially after the pandemic. It's all about short format video content. And these poor merchants, they just started taking pictures for their Instagram feeds. <laughs> and now they're required to do videos. And that's a lot of work. So um, I really appreciate uh, organizations like the Chinatown Merchants because they are giving a digital voice to these merchants in a way that they can't accomplish that themselves. So um, it takes a village, as they say, especially in the small business community. And you guys, you know, especially Chinatown, you guys are really, really pushing it. Uh, so thank you again. Um, so I just got to notice we have a winner for Chinatown. Drum roll. I'm writing this down. Our new friend, ah, Melissa Gould. Congratulations. I'll reach out to you after the program and I'll introduce you to the merchant that's offering the, the promotion. Actually, I know the merchant, right, Eva? China Live. If you guys haven't been to China Live, it's an amazing venue. It's, it's an emporium of um, food, a Chinese culinary experience. And it's really something unique in the US, I think. So we really wanna thank you for uh, you know, participating in this. All right, so where are we going next? We're going down south now. We're gonna pay a visit to uh, Dog Patch, Vibrant Dog Patch. Our representative is Susan Eslick. She is the treasurer of the Dog Patch Business Association. And in fact, uh, Dog Patch was voted one of the top neighborhoods in the world by Time Out Magazine. So this is a huge honor. Uh, welcome to the stage. Susan. Okay, I'm Susan Eslick, and I'm representing the Dog Patch Business Association. I've been a Dog Patch business and property owner for the past 27 years. I helped create the Dog Patch Historic District and was a founder of our Green Benefit District. Uh, we're the only Green Benefit District in the country, and a Green Benefit District is um, modeled after community benefit districts. Since Dog Patch has this industrial past, first of all, let me just tell you where is Dog Patch because a lot of people don't know. Dog Patch is on the east side of San Francisco, several blocks south of the Chase Center, Mission Bay. Uh, we have waterfront access, and um, it's along the central water, the central subway T line, so it's very accessible. Um, mm -hmm. Dog Patch was once an industrial booming economy in the central waterfront, and um, we have lots of warehouses mixed in with residential houses. And, you know, Dog Patch, I always like to say, is it's really one of the most, the original mixed use neighborhood in San Francisco. So we're, we're quite unique that way. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you, you're based in Dog Patch. You, I'm based you work with I lots have, of community. Yeah. Yes, I'm involved a lot in the community. Um, I actually do accounting for small businesses. So while I am involved with the Dog Patch Business Association, small business like you is very important to me. And um, what else can I tell you about you know, dogs? Um, I, I always love Dog Patch because it's such a, you know, it's a, it, it's a mini maze. It's such a, well confined area uh in in the area so like what what are there's there's the waterfront is developing there's as well the, right yes we have well i happen to think as well as many that we have act, the best weather in dog patch i mean we're we're 10 degrees warmer here than in many other neighborhoods so that's a beautiful thing it's easy biking um very easy to pick up a lime and come down here and, and scoot around um you know, the vibe in Dog Patch is creative, family friendly, uh, creative. We have a really rich and vibrant arts district, which is fairly new in the last five years. So we have museums and galleries, and that is all mixed in with our local restaurants and, you know, access to the waterfront. Yeah, so you can make like a whole day experience in Dog Patch. What Absolutely. are some of the museums and galleries that? Um, so we that you're have the about? we have the the Minnesota Street Project, which is a collective of a variety of different galleries. It is 
the most fantastic place to visit to see a lot of contemporary art. We also have the Museum of Craft and Design, which is a fantastic organization. And I might add, they have one of the best uh, museum shops around and they were also voted. I can't remember exactly, but they got high votes for their gift shop. Um, the Institute of Con Contemporary Art has opened up right here in Dogpatch as well. And that opened up last couple months ago. And that also is another destination. Oh, that's brilliant. I didn't know that. Thank yes. you. Yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we do, we, it, I mean, we really do, you know, a, a lot of the galleries have moved out of downtown San Francisco where they have been historically and they have located here. So we're quite uh, proud to have the arts district that we have. Wow. And then tell us about Pier 70. That's a huge project. Yes, Pier 70. And there's also the Petrero Power Station. So Pier 70 is a huge development which also has historic buildings. You know, last week, the mayor did her um, State of the City address from Pier 70 in Dogpatch. So we're, we were quite honored to host her. And um, so Pier 70 is a huge development that um, is, you know, um, maybe possibly a little bit on hold um, because of just where things are with the economy. but. They have the infrastructure is there, and you know we're very excited to have that be our new neighbor, you know, to the east along the water to Dogpatch. Yeah, it's it's really a spectacular project, and you, you know the way the waterfront is opening up to the public is really amazing. It's really yes. highlighting how you know, our connection to the water. Yes, uh, because in the past we were shielding ourselves from the water. That's exactly right. And, you know, for years in the 27 years that I've lived here and, and I've been in San Francisco for 42 years, you know, when I would tell people that dog patch is near the water, they would, everybody would have this look like what? So now we also, the port um, during COVID opened up Crane Cove Park, which is right on the water. That's just a little bit, that's just south of Chase. So the, the, it's a fantastic park. I mean, we just feel incredibly gifted that the port did this and that it's in our neighborhood. So um, that's a great thing to visit. Totally, totally. Um, and then finally, I know historically um, Dogpatch has a strong maker community. Yes. Um, that's, because I mean, when I had my store back in the day, all my artists were from Dogpatch or Bayview. Right. That's where the maker community was. Right. And because Dogpatch, you know, had that historic industrial past, we have a lot of warehouses here. And those warehouses have been converted into, you know, small artist studios and designer spaces. And the American Industrial Center, which is a huge building that used to be the American Can Company, two very large buildings along 3rd Street from 20th Street down to 23rd Street, there are over 350 individual businesses within those buildings. We have chocolate makers, we have shoe makers, we have, you know, a myriad of restaurants located in that building. Graphic designers, photographers, I mean, so many things are made right here in Dogpatch. So it's what well, I really love that things are made here because that's historically rope used to be made here for the ships during the war times. So, you know, we, we've just been a center for making things. So I think that when people come and visit Dogpatch, you, that creativity and that uniqueness, you, it's, I think it's just palpable in the architecture and just how it feels here. So we're proud of that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you said that because what I like about Dogpatch is there's, there's a architectural refinement to some of the, the buildings and you know renovations. And then there's a historical authenticity to some of the buildings as well. So there's that nice juxtaposition. Yes. And we have um, 120 contributing properties to the historic district. And be, being a his, historic district is not only about just the buildings, 
but it's also about what took place there. So um, you're right. And it's, uh, those, are, those are fantastic little houses to see here. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of neighborhoods, which are not, you know, super well defined. You need to like right. circumnavigate yeah. and go down the hill and then go this alley. And, um, you know, it's, it, if I can go back to Lyme, it's a great neighborhood to Lyme around in. <laughs> it's, it's a fantastic neighborhood for that. It's a, it's a great neighborhood for bike riding and walking and because we're flat and so ex easily accessible to Caltrain, 280 and the East Bay. So right. we were, we're very connected that way. Cool, thank you. And I know everyone is posting about the new RH. Um, um, oh, yes. You know, well, you know, super fancy breakfast spot down there too. Well, it's, it's open seven days a week. I don't wanna be a total promoter, but I mean, it's open from 10 in the morning till nine o'clock at night. And, you know, if you wanted a perfect day in dog patch, you know, you you take the 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 central subway T line and get off and get some coffee along Third Street and a pastry and meander through the pocket parks that we have from the Green cool. Benefit District. Visit the museums. You could top. You could end it at R H with a cocktail on the roof. That's it. That's it. Ready it's all about that. <laughs> uh, I just got noticed. We have a winner for Dog Patch. Um, our winner is Jana Jota. Jana, congratulations. Uh, we will reach out to you very soon with uh, the merchant. Susan, please tell me, I know we picked the merchant. Who, who is the merchant again? Can you tell us about the merchant? Oh, it's Mainstay Market, which is our, our green grocer that opened up during COVID. They have fabulous products. Bravo, thank you. You said it best. <laughs> Well, thanks for the sh short visit to uh, Dog Patch, and I can't wait to go back again. Okay, so finally, we have a very special Renaissance community leader. I've known her for many years. Uh, Megan Mitchell is the officer and founding member, member of the African American Arts and Cultural District, and we are so happy to have her. You are involved throughout the city with many organizations. Um, please tell us a little bit about Megan your history and um, what you're doing now. Good to meet everyone. Good to have some, uh, you know, representation within these attendees. Thanks for joining in. My name is Megan Mitchell. I am first and foremost, a San Francisco native from the Bayview district. Um, I have a lot of pride within my community, um, a black, a predominantly black community um, historically where I, my grandmother owned a house here, my parents own a house here, I own a home here. And it's like, we are keeping our homes because we know what happens when we sell. So this is like how intense it is over here. Very, very focused on making sure that there's limited gentrification moving forward. And that when opportunities come into our community, that people like me and other organizations like SF Black Wall Street or, you know, the Bayview Opera House or any like nonprofit organization you could think of that is connected to the African-American culture is working really hard to make sure that we have some representation within the city. I'm one of the founders of the African-American Arts and Cultural District which, you know, in a way serves kind of like a green community benefit district or a CBD or a merchants association. Really, it's just a group of concerned citizens, business owners, property owners, all representative of the black community who are just making sure that um, we're paying closer attention to what city policies may affect us, you know, our new, um, our new like uh, bike lanes being built in our communities. I hope they are. I'm also one of the board members of the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition. Are, you know, what other kind of economical activities are there for us? That's what um, our organization about. So again, the Bayview has the highest concentration of the African-American home ownership population while even still we're in this dwindling, you know, our population is dwindling. We, we're still really focused on um, keeping it within the southeast part of the city. Um, and most of you know about the Hunters Point Naval Shipyard that was here many years ago, way before our time, where a lot of people worked. Um, and, you know, once 
it closed, a lot of people migrated out, a lot of things happened within the community that were unhealthy, that were not helpful. So it's like working on uh, policies like that too. Now, interesting thing about Bayview, uh, Hunter's Point, is kind of similar to Dog Patch. We have kind of a lot of things that are like the production, distribution, and repair. We're kind of zoned with a lot of uh, warehouses and different things like that. And a lot of things actually come from Bayview that serve the whole city of San Francisco and even some places nationwide. Like, um, I'll give you some examples, like Evergood Sausages. The factory is here. You find Evergood Sausages all in any grocery store you can think of, Gus's. Um, the, the new one in Dog Patch, like Safeway, Lucky's, wherever. It all comes from Bayview. Uh, same thing with the 7-Up Bottle Company, all the soda. It, it's packed in the Bayview district. Same thing with Hostess, all those cupcakes uh, comes from the Bayview district. Now, what's interesting about that is in having all those uh, companies that are just really focused on distribution, because we were in a situation where we felt like we didn't have a lot of transportation options, we really wanted to create more of a merchants community around here. We uh, decided that we would work more with distribution companies, um, some that are smaller, to make sure that they have storefronts where people could actually walk up and buy, which is why we have like the den at Craftsman and Wolves. So Craftsman and Wolves makes like these really fancy, uh, breads and, and bagels and all types of things you could think of. And when he opened, the owner, he decided we should have part of this go like, you know, be a cafe so we could serve stuff to the community. And it, and it worked. Same thing with Grotto Wines, who makes wine. He used to make wine out of her garage, but now makes it out of um, a business. Same thing with Laughing Monk Brewing, who's a really popular, great beer. And then we also have two kitchens called, one's the Baby Maker's Kitchen, and then there's the Ujala Kitchen both which work with locals who um, are caterers and wanted to come up with some way of distributing to the community. Now, the other cool thing about that, and sorry, I know I'm talking like a mile a minute, but I'm trying to like- <laughs> There's a you. lot, I'm <laughs> taking notes. <laughs> but the other cool thing about that is with um, in some of our distribution, and I'm talking about like the really, really local people, um, some of our products have been used in this pilot that uh, recently, um, it's called Baby Lucky. So Baby Lucky is not a model that you would see in any other part of, of the nation right now. We, the, we are the first to have Baby Lucky, which is a smaller scale of Luckies that focuses more on affordability and like on local makers. So a lot of these businesses that I just named, you'll find them that Baby Lucky along with um, healthy produce and meats and other things. Why is that there? Because we were considered a food desert. We didn't have a many options for a healthy grocery store. So it's kind of like all these things are full circle. Um, we're a community that has been without for a really, really long time. And really what we had to do is kind of look within our own resources and make things happen. And people saw it and they were like, oh, I, I like what they're doing. How can I support? So that's kind of where we are right now. Um, some other really great things about Bayview. We have two landmarks within our district. Um, the Bayview Opera House um, and Sam Jordan's Bar and Grill, which is closed, but will be reopening again and will keep its name, Sam, uh, Sam Jordan's Bar and Grill. So yeah, um, we also have the largest artist community within the nation um, over at the Bayview uh, Shipyard, the Naval Shipyard. There's the, um, the, the artist colony that's over there with about 300 artists and they do open studios in spring and in winter. Um, a lot of the stuff that you see if you're if you're a burner and you go to Burning Man comes from the box shop, which is located at Hunter's Point. Um, there's a colony of artists there that work on the floats and everything. And then there's also the Flaming Lotus Girls who do some of like the sparking things. So yeah, I mean, we're just pretty much a really dope neighborhood. We have a lot happening here. We have a lot of businesses opening. We have a lot of legacy businesses. And really, you know, the way I see it, um, it's like we're a canvas, like I'm just a, there's so much opportunity, you know? Whenever we see an empty storefront along with the Third Street Corridor, we'll put art in it, we'll do something because we just want to keep things connected. So we're just like really creative and we're really community focused over here. And, and I'll, I'll uh, finish by saying the great thing about all of us being on this call and all of these different neighborhoods and what they have to offer is now we have the central subway. So if you want to see it for yourself, 
you could just get on the train, start, you know, in Chinatown or start in Bayview and just make your way through and, and stop everywhere. And I'm done. Wow. I love it. Megan, bravo. Um, you know, it's, it's nice that the city is being stitched back together again and there's that connectivity. So it brings us together because the more we bump into each other and, and you know, share pleasantries on the street, the more we become comfortable with one another. And I love um, Bayview. I love the long corridor, Third Street corridor. It really has a lot of legacy small businesses, new, new small businesses, and the vibes are always good. You know, um, I walk yeah. it, I drive it, I take, you know, different um, public transportation, and it's always fun. There's always places where you can, and when you walk a corridor, Megan, it's really important to slow down, get out of your car, walk, take a line, you know, do whatever, a bicycle, just slow down. Because when we slow down, we tend to notice things more than if we're in our car and we're just buzzing through. So that being said, I love Third Street Corridor. It's very diverse. It's super long. It's one, it's one of the biggest corridors in the city. But what I like about Bayview, just like Dog Patch, is all the pockets and the hidden spots all around. I've been to so many merchant walks in Bayview and I'm always amazed, like some of the things that you mentioned in your presentation, I didn't know. <laughs> so um, it's time to explore the city again. You know, we always say be a tourist in your own town. Um, thank you, Megan, that was yeah. excellent. Bravo. Uh, we have another um, uh, poll for you, a uh, line poll. Which of these would be your ideal destination via a Lime e-scooter or e-bike? Okay, Ocean Ave, Aquatic Park, Ferry Building, Palace of Fine Arts. Okay, a few more seconds. I mean, um, as a small business owner, that was my challenge to slow people down. And when you slow them down, they tend to see your neighborhood, your stores, and then what, when they come into your store, it's important to slow them down because a lot of us, we kind of just rush through stores. So uh, scooters are good for that. All right, so it looks like, oh, it's a tie. Ferry Building and Palace of Fine Arts. Good choices, iconic spots. Great, thank you. So uh, we do have a winner for uh, the baby as well. The winner is uh, Debbie Itawin. Itawin, Debbie, we're gonna reach out to you after and uh, we'll uh, make an uh, introduction to you and the participating uh, merchant in um, the baby as well. All right, so let's continue here. Uh, time is going fast. So um, if you have any questions for our panelists, please put it in the Q&A section. But I would like to start this Q&A section with the ultimate question. This is kind of like the Olympics of uh, neighborhoods. P paint for us a picture, a perfect day in North Beach, Chinatown, Bayview dog patch. So Ida, you're first. Paint for us a picture like in the morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it might be. So when we have visitors, my husband and I, we like to start in the morning at the cafe. You see all the neighborhood people, chat, great people watching, some coffee and so forth. And we head up to Kuwait Tower, to show them Kuwait Tower. And we come back down, I would go stop by City Lights, in the Beat Museum wander down Grand Avenue and check out the cool galleries and the shops. Now it's probably about lunchtime. Go over to one of the delis, get a great sandwich, and head over to Washington Square Park, which is really beautiful, especially in the afternoons to sit and relax, have a nice lunch. Maybe walk over to St. Peter and Paul's, walk into the church, check it out, and come back out and go see more shops. And uh, let's not forget happy hour. Happy hour, lots of options. I don't want to just pinpoint, you know, there's some great ones, especially around the park there. Um, then I would go, where would I go? Go back. I mean, there's so many places to see in the neighborhood. Sometimes you just want to, you know, sit and observe everything that's going around. You know, then it would have, you know, nice dinner in the evening and definitely finish off the night with summer live music. There's lots of live music now, which is great. So I highly recommend that. You'll be really tired to sleep well after a long day in North Beach. 
Thank you. I think that's a good day in North Beach, a truly iconic neighborhood here in the city. Very picturesque too. Um, so let's cruise over to uh, Chinatown. I haven't tried it yet, but I understand there's some Tai Chi exercises over at Portsmouth Square or St. Mary's Square, or the locals do some exercising early in the morning. So if you want to catch, that's a great way to start the day. Uh, followed by, you probably get a little hungry, probably go to one of the side uh, little restaurants and get a, a bowl of jok or that rice porridge with the Chinese donut. It's really yummy and very nourishing. And after you uh, get your little, little light breakfast, you can go up to Stockton Street and observe all the hustle and bustle on Stockton Street where they have the fresh fruits and vegetables, um, the fish, the hanging ducks, uh, and lots more. If you guys still, if you still want to nibble, there's plenty of places to nibble up there. Um, and then afterwards, I'd, I'd go for some dim sum, uh, which is the little plates of uh, different kinds of Chinese like I, you guys know it as tapas, but um, made of chicken or sausage or shrimp, all kinds of variety. There's a new one up on Lai Hong, up on Pao. People might want to try that one that's on Broadway. And um, so after that, they can, after they're full, better go do some more walking along the corridor. Uh, they've got to Stockton. They can go along Grant. There's plenty of shops to browse around. Uh, Kimonona is a brand new one that everybody likes to, to stop and buy there. That beautiful kimonos are uh, legacy businesses like the walk shop, um, the Chinatown Kite store, Canon Bazaar, uh, lovely places along that. Uh, even And even uh, boba shops and ice cream shops would have you, after you finished uh, doing a little shopping and a little hungry and wanting a little snack. Um, or you can still continue sightseeing going along from Grant up to Waverly, which is a very nice little alley uh, where the oldest temple was up up there uh, to see that one. And then following Waverly, going up to, of course, can't miss the fortune cookie factory. But zigzagging back up to, up because there's lots of hills, take advantage of the walking to go up clay to go to the Chinese Historic Society to see the Bruce Lee exhibit. He's a, he was born and raised, actually, Bruce Lee, uh, who uh, was born in, in Chinatown. And so it'd be interesting to hear like more of his background. And then after that, you can, after you finish that, I mean, there's so many things to do in Chinatown. I mean, you go down to Jay Chocolates and have a little snack and a little pastry, or you can go down to Jane's Bakery, who is another new one, or go have some matcha or a bobble drink or an ice cream. Um, uh, you make reservations to catch Mr. Jude's as a Michelin star, but you have to have, most of the time you have to have reservations. And, or you can check out China Live. It's fantastic. He's on Broadway. He's, he, George Chen is a wonderful fellow, the owner. He did a $20 million reservation in that place. So if you've never seen it, I really uh, don't miss it because China Live is just a beautiful place to just go in there and visit. Even if you just have a drink, you have a little dinner. And then finally, after that, you have to go down, of course, and if you want to have some music, you go down to the alley on Lion's Den over there in Wentworth. Our friends at Bayview, Megan, paint for us a perfect picture. First of all, before I go into Bayview, I just want to give a shout out to China Live and Chinatown. I love that restaurant. Um, I, feel like, I feel like that menu uh, was inspired a lot by Cecilia Shang and um, Alexander Ong. So Cecilia Shang from Mandarin Restaurant, Alexander Ong, he used to have beetle nut. I know, I know it because I can taste it and I used to work for them. Anyway, right. <laughs> I love that place. All right, so Bayview, let's talk about Bayview though. Okay, <laughs> so the way I would open up my day in Baby one is in my backyard because it's the sunniest neighbor, um, neighborhood I believe in the whole city and feel free to fight with me on this dog patch, but I think we got the sun on lock over in the Baby district. Um, and then I would probably head over to um, Archimedes Banya for the spa. Um, just to like relax, maybe take a yoga class and, you know, get some steam in. Then I head over to Cafe Alma for breakfast and then bike my way back to Third Street Corridor or scoot Lime, <laughs> my way back to the Third Street Corridor um, and head over to Grotta Wines where I do some wine tasting, um, do like a nice little wine, you know, pairing. And then probably uh, make my way back over towards um, 
like all good pizza because a lot of the times they have they're the host to like either the farmer's market or do some sort of live outdoor music or even in arts um exhibit it's 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 usually one of those three so I make my way over there and then probably go eat you know at one of the restaurants um along the corridor um probably like in the baby maker's kitchen check in with Dante Ball mm. at both social who's about to open soon um and then probably head back to Grotto because I like wine a lot and hang out <laughs> until it was dinner time we're mostly food and booze so that's my perfect day in the Bayview hey, that that brings <laughs> people together Megan that's yeah. that's the glue that binds us together yes <laughs> no matter what Bravo, thank you so much. And finally, my friend Susan, but just kind of give us a synopsis because we're running out of time too. So again, I would take the brand new Central Studway and get off. And you know, you could go to Neighbor Bakehouse, which is on Third Street, and you can have coffee and a pastry. And then you can meander around, go visit the the arts district and the mute the Museum of Craft and Design and shop at their gift shop. And then we have a a whole bunch of restaurants and that you can have lunch or you can you can even go to Mainstay Market and take something to go and go to Crane Cove Park and sit by the water. You can get your nails done on 22nd Street. You can, what else can you do? There you can have, there's lots of beer and breweries that we have. We also have a bocce court. I don't know if people are aware of that, oh, but we do have so dog patch bocce. And our friends from the Bayview, we play against them. We play against actually everybody in the city. There's a bocce league. And what else can you do? You know, mm -hmm. paddleboard. That's beautiful. Yeah. So there's a lot. There's, there's a, a lot. lot to do. It depends what your age is and what your interests are. And I think we cover a lot. It's all good. So Charlie, I think we have a, the makings of a new program uh, in the future. You, you can cover these neighborhoods with lime. I was writing there, down, like, all of these things, not even just for lime, but for my own. Just <laughs> wow, these are just fantastic recommendations. But I agree with you 100. Yeah, totally. So you know what? We have a grand prize winner here that we need to announce: free unlimited uh, lime rides for a month across the freaking city. And um, ah, this is wonderful. Our friend Zachary Borja. He is a true community advocate in the city and also in the East Bay as well. And Zachary, congratulations. You're gonna love cruising around the neighborhoods on a Lime scooter. So bravo, I'll reach out to you after the program. So, wow, it's 5.03, we're a little bit over time, but I just wanna say it's an honor to be in your presence. You guys are true community leaders. You're inspiring. Every time we've done this a few times, but every time we sit down together, I'm always learning something new about you, your neighborhoods, and the evolution of this amazing city. So um, all good things must come to an end. So in closing, I just want to say uh, small businesses are the cultural and economic backbone of our community. That's a fact. And in fact, you can see that they are the public living rooms to our neighborhoods. And I always say small business is big business. Uh, there are 90,000 businesses here in the city. Half of them are considered small business. That means they employ 10 or less employees. However, they employ uh, over 350,000 people here in the city. These are city hall stats. I'm not making them up. And uh, finally, if we change our buying by just 1% people, 1%, it creates $100 million back to the local economy. And that's why we've been doing these programs with our private public partners because it's going to take a village for our city to realize it's it's great, but it, it could be even better. And of course, you can see these neighborhoods are beacons of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And with that, I'm going to say, see you at the next program. And we would love to continue this conversation with uh, Lime and also our other private public partners as well. So thank you again. Bye-bye.